signals of very high frequencies are employed, and it is necessary to have an instrument which will be capable of responding at such frequencies. Due to the mass and therefore inertia of their moving parts, even the most delicate of ordinary instruments can only respond at frequencies up to a few thousand cycles per second. The cathode ray tube does not suffer from this limitation, since the moving part involved is a beam of electrons of negligible mass. It is therefore invaluable in connection with radio, since it will respond faithfully and trace out waveforms accurately at frequencies even of 10 million cycles per second. The earliest forms of cathode ray tube were known nearly 50 years ago, and many years later were first used as laboratory instruments. As a result of improvements which led to the production of the modern type low voltage vacuum or hard tube, in 1929, many more applications of the cathode ray tube became possible, probably the best known being television. It does too, they have started. break of war, a new development, previously secret, was rumoured, detection of enemy aircraft and shipping. Research on the uses of the cathode ray tube was concentrated on its application to radar, of which it is one of the most important components, and resulted in the development of radar devices for many other purposes. But let us see what is understood by the name cathode ray tube. In appearance, it consists of a tube of this form which has been evacuated. As will be explained later, a beam of electrons is produced which is focused to form a spot on the screen on the inside of the end of the tube. And the spot is moved by bending the beam. The beam is bending up and down at a low frequency, but as this frequency is increased, this is the result. Remember that you're watching a moving spot, although because of the effect of the electrons on the screen coating and persistence of vision, it would appear that the tube is producing a line. The principle of the cathode ray tube is similar to that of a radio valve, and as in the case of the latter, the source of electrons is the cathode. Current is passed through the filament, or heater as it's called, and the heated cathode gives off electrons from the specially treated surface at the end. Some little distance away from the cathode is a metal disc, which is called the first anode or the accelerator. This is maintained at a positive voltage with respect to the cathode, and therefore, as in the case of the anode of a valve, attracts electrons away from the cathode. The first anode, however, has a hole at its centre, and some of the electrons pass through and continue on down the tube, thus forming the beam of electrons. The inside of the end of the tube is coated with a fine crystalline powder, which becomes fluorescent when bombarded by the stream of electrons, thus causing a glow on the tube face. In order conveniently to control the electron flow, the cathode is surrounded by the modulating cylinder, or grid as it is called, to bring it into line with valve terminology. This grid is maintained at a low negative voltage with respect to the cathode, and so tends to repel electrons since they are negative charges of electricity. Electrons can only escape through a small hole in its end, and those that do so are attracted towards and pass through the first anode, as explained earlier. By varying the grid voltage, the quantity of electrons flowing, or the beam current,
can be altered so that the brilliance of the resulting spot on the fluorescent screen can be set at any desired level. If the grid is made sufficiently negative, the electron flow can be stopped completely and the tube is then said to be blacked out. The electrodes producing the electron beam are usually referred to as the electron gun. In these pictures, the beam has been shown, although in a vacuum tube, it is invisible. The glow must be focused to a fine spot if it is to be of practical value. And with the electrostatic focusing system, this is done by the introduction of two more anodes. The first anode, at a fixed positive voltage with respect to the cathode, is still used as an accelerator. The second anode is a cylinder and its voltage, which is also positive and higher than that of the first anode, can be varied. The third is another disk at a still higher positive fixed voltage. The paths of the electrons are bent by the electric forces due to these anode voltages so that they all arrive on the screen at the same spot. As electrons cannot be seen in a vacuum tube, a small quantity of gas has been introduced into this tube for demonstration purposes. It is the glow caused by the ionization of this gas that can be seen. The beam is focused just beyond the third anode. Increasing the second anode voltage brings the point of focus to the tube face. In this case, just over 1,000 volts. Further increase spreads the beam, reducing the voltage, increasing it again. Now the beam is in focus once more. The glass envelope from the screen to the third anode is coated on the inside by some conducting material, usually graphite and one or two contact springs connect the coating to this anode. This is to enable the electrons that reach the screen to return to the cathode via the third anode and cathode ray tube power pack and thus avoid an accumulation of an electric charge on the screen. In practice, the third anode is earthed so that the other electrodes will all be at successively more negative voltages in the order second anode, first anode, cathode, and grid. The grid is thus still negative with respect to the cathode, whilst the three anodes are positive with respect to it. Another method of focusing uses an electromagnetic system in which the first anode is retained in the form of a cylinder, but the second and third anodes are omitted and instead, a coil of a large number of turns of fine wire is slipped onto the tube. Normally, the coil is enclosed in a metal sheet, leaving a narrow annular gap. A small current, which can be varied, is maintained in the coil, producing a field of this type. A force is exerted on each electron at right angles to the field lines in this direction. The path follows about half a revolution about the axis, leading the field in such a direction that the velocity of the electron will carry it towards the axis of the tube to meet the other electrons at the focal point of the electron lens. As the current is varied, the point of focus is moved along the axis. 